I'm so delighted to see all of you here. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Betty G, Associate Dean for Faculty Systems. Um, and this event, Punya, do you want to just say hey um, to folks? Sure. Hi, I'm Punya Mishra. I'm Associate Dean for Scholarship and Innovation, and just excited to be working with Betty and others on the team like Clarin to start the series that we're calling Just an Hour. Yeah, so, so this is a brand new series for this year that um, we've jointly planned and um, we're, we're really looking forward to getting folks together as the description suggests, this is just an hour um, and an opportunity for, we hope to as many of us as possible engage in interesting thought provoking conversations about topics ranging from the research that folks are doing in the college and connected to um, in the university about interesting topics or and relevant topics for us as academics. And in other ways, try to hopefully rebuild and provide different kinds of opportunities for us to connect around um, the sorts of conversations that I think most of us became academics to engage in. So, so the first, our first topic, as you know, um, is or first uh, um, set of topics for today is the is to talk with the newer faculty or some newer faculty in the college about some of their research, what excites them, the kind of work they're doing on as an opportunity for everyone to get to know them a little bit better and hopefully for them to start making connections with other folks in the college. So the format today will be relatively informal. Um, we're going to ask each of the faculty members to briefly introduce themselves. And then Punya and I will kick the conversation off with a few questions. Um, but before we start, I'd like to just um, turn it over to Punya to give you a sense of some other things that are going on in case we don't get a chance to, to return to those and wrap things up at the end. So Punya, would like you sure. like to share some of those things? Sure. So thank you, Betty. And <clears throat> I think that the main thing that you know when Betty and I were talking about this is that we are often so busy we don't get a chance to engage in sort of conversations around ideas and we said what would be one way that we could do this that would be open to all our faculty to all our doctoral students um, so I think that's sort of an important piece so uh, please ask your friends to join in we have like keeping this very informal but an opportunity to get to know each other uh, explore different ideas um, the other thing is there are a couple of surveys that you should have received in your email. And I think, Clarin, if you could drop the links there, these are going to take you just a couple of minutes. Uh, so one is we are trying to build a better sort of a social media underst I mean, understanding of the social media used by our faculty so that we can support these better um, as we go forward, thinking of a new strategy around that to promote the work that our faculty and doctoral students do. And we have also redesigned the sort of the publication roundup because we felt that that was very narrow. We wanted to expand it to include all the kinds of different things that our faculty do. Um, just in the last couple of days, you know, um, if I can uh, mention, you know, Eugene Judson emailed us saying that he was nominated or was selected to receive this presidential award for. Um, social embeddedness for a project that he's doing. Uh, so David Carlson was doing something interesting. I mean, those are the kinds of things we were not capturing. So you'll see this new form attempts to do that. It also tries to make it easier for you to fill it out so that you're just dropping a citation or a link and not having to you know, put a lot of effort into that. So please take a few minutes to do that. Uh, we, in terms of upcoming events, we have a doctoral research mixer coming up on the 16th. We would love to see all of you there. Um, and we are planning uh, a really, I think, an interesting topic for next uh, Friday's just an hour. Uh, we often talk about transdisciplinary learning, uh, and we are hoping to bring an interesting panel of people together to sort of explore what do we mean when we say transdisciplinary, even ASU prides itself on that, and, and so on. Um, so uh, also finally, uh, a plug for the website, myeducation.asu.edu. We have sort of tried to update that. It had become sort of, it had some dead pages and so on. Uh, a lot of resources available there. We'll keep 
you know, reminding you of it. Uh, but there's a lot of, and we would love to get your feedback on what else we could put on those pages. Um, with that, uh, Betty, back to you, because I know we have just an hour. <laughs> Okay, um, thanks for all of that information, Punya. Um, and now enough about us and what we're doing. Uh, I'd like to have the new faculty introduce themselves. We've asked each of them just to say their name, um, the program area that they're working in, and um, just maybe a sentence about their research focus. So, and I do encourage everyone, if you've got comments or questions or anything, please use the chat because we can return to that for questions later. Um, and I do encourage you to choose the speaker option, at least at first, so you can see our new faculty when they introduce themselves, since there's so many folks here. So Tara, would you like to begin? Yes, and I was actually admiring Punya's like device. Like, I want to have a microphone. Like, you look real fancy here. That's just a prop. It doesn't do anything. <laughs> it just looks cool. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. My name is Tara Nkuma. I am in a joint appointment. I'm in the School of Social Transformation, where I'm the acting executive director for the Center for Gender Equity in Science and Technology. And then I'm in the teacher preparation division one. Um, my research agenda is equitable teaching practices. I come with over 20 years of education uh, experience teaching both in middle and high school internationally as well as here in the US. And my research really uses a lot of culturally relevant practices as well as theater of the oppressed. And I'm really excited to hopefully engage some of you here in that practice of theater of the oppressed at some point in my time here. So it's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you. Ooh, sign me up. I would love to learn more about that. So thanks, Antonio. Yes, hi everyone. My name is Antonio Duran. My pronouns are he, him, his, el. Um, I am an assistant professor in the higher and post-secondary education program here at ASU. Super excited to see some of my wonderful colleagues here. Uh, my research uh, broadly uh, focuses on understanding how historical and contemporary legacies of oppression, um, e.g. racism, heterosexism, trans oppression, um, influence college student development experiences and success. And I'm looking forward to sharing a little bit more about what that all means in a bit. Thanks so much, Antonio. Um, Carlos, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hello, everybody. Um, good afternoon. My name is Carlos Casanova. I'm starting my third year here now. Um, it's going by so fast. Um, I'm an assistant professor in the Ed Studies Department. Um, kind of broadly speaking, my research tends to focus on um, what's well, situated in community-based organizations. Um, primarily community-based organizations that have a social justice focus, a critical perspective to them. Um, within those spaces, I, I kind of tend to, and also my research, so I'm trained in youth participatory action research, um, critical ethnographic research, so a lot of my work is participatory in nature. And so within these spaces, I tend to explore or focus on many aspects, but one aspect that I've been or one area of, of research that I've been focused on lately is the, is the pedagogical approach, the pedagogy that's being used in these spaces that helps to support critical conscious development um, within participants and, and primarily these spaces are, these participants are, they tend to be young women of color, primarily Latina youth and, and undocumented first generation youth. Um, so that's kind of uh, where my work is in. And there's many other areas within that work I focus on, but I'm sure we'll have time to talk a little bit more about that later. So nice to see you all. Thanks so much, Carlos. Evandra. You're up next. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Evangel Catherine. I just ended my second year in um, the early childhood program in D1. I also co-lead a children's equity project, the children's equity project over at Sanford School, which is a policy and uh, research sort of kind of center. Um, I consider myself a policy researcher, and I'll probably get an opportunity to describe that later, but I focus on equity policy in early childhood across all systems, and so instead of just having one intervention point, um, I try to intersect at all points, so looking at quality, 
when I'm thinking about discipline and children with disabilities, thinking about what does inclusion look like, thinking about what those funding models look like, what program is it? Is it Head Start? Is it child care? Is it state pre-K? So early childhood is not like K-12, you know, it's not a universal system. So my research looks at how to address equity and all of these aspects across the early childhood system. Um, I started at discipline, but in order to address discipline, there are so many other components that has to be addressed. And so I essentially use my research to make policy recommendations to transform policy at the national level and at the state level, so. Thanks so much, Avandra. Um, and I believe Matthew, he's running late. I don't think I see him here yet. Yeah, he, he emailed saying that he's stuck and he'll try and join in as soon as he can. Okay, so. great. So, so what we're gonna do next is we have a few prepared questions um, that uh, Punya and I will start with. We're not gonna ask all of the participants to respond to each one. So we're just gonna use those to get the conversation started and then we'll turn to a more general conversation. So let's see, Carlos, I'm gonna start with you. What got you interested in the work that you do? Can you say a little bit more about that? Yeah, um, so uh, this is a long kind of what got me interested, but I'll try to make it short. Um, so when in 2015, when I went up to Iowa State from San Antonio to start my or my doctoral studies, that was the same time that, you know, the political context and, and the former president was engaging in his campaign rally, and he was a lot of attacks on Mexican-Americans, immigrants, um, you know, many bad, many horrible things were said about, about this particular group and attacked in many different ways. And so when I went up to Iowa, I was, um, I was introduced to a youth organization that was just creating its high school component. So it, it was just trying to recruit high school young people to this space, um, trying to bring them in to really focus on education. It was about education attainment, college um, acceptance, and, and um, high school graduation. But once, and that was in 2015, so once the political rhetoric started heightening, um, there was three uh, staff who was there and, and the students that were getting, there was about 25 students, 30 students that showed up every Wednesday. And a lot of these students, they were first generation, undocumented, documented, mixed status families. And a lot of them at the beginning of this time, they really had a lot of internalized oppression. It was they were blaming themselves for these issues that they were in. They were blaming themselves for the certain the current social political context and then why their family wasn't successful. You know these mainstream ideas of success that we think about. And so we as a, as a faculty member started putting together pedagogical approaches and practices that we could challenge some of their views and perspectives and ideologies that they had, and sort of support and develop their critical consciousness around immigration issues, race and racism in education, gender issues in education. And so part of my work was I was facilitating the pedagogy, I was facilitating weekly meetings, but also I was taking observations and making observations. So for almost three or four years, really four years, I worked with a group of young people who I sort of documented the process of the pedagogical approach that was used to foster and, and nurture the critical consciousness. So that's kind of where the work came about and it sort of emerged from this, you know, state, federal anti-immigrant politics in Iowa, race of nativism in the public school system um, that they were experiencing during this time. And so, and, and just kind of one more last thing, my, before I started my study or my doctoral studies, I come with, you know, 10 to 11 years of, of community-based organization work. I was a director, youth specialist. So I've always been in those settings and I feel those settings of, are really nurturing and fostering for a lot of young people who are, you know, dehumanizing the public school system. Great, thanks so much. I just realized a flaw in our plan, which is that I'd love to continue talking with, with Carlos about what he's doing, given my own interest in some of these out-of-school programs. But, um, but I do want to make sure that we um, have Matthew introduce himself. Matthew, I hope you've had a chance to catch your breath. What we started with was having all of our participants just briefly introduce themselves and say a little bit about their program area and just a little bit about the your research focus before we um, dive into some of these questions. So Matthew, would you introduce yourself? Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me here today. I am Olusheyi Matthew Wadebi. 
I go by Matthew. So I am an assistant professor in the uh, division of teacher prep. Uh, my area of research focus on teaching is uh, elementary education and social studies. And I do that within um, cross-cultural uh, context. Uh, basically, I look at how teachers, uh, candidate, uh, learn to teach, and now they make sense of what I call pedagogical design capacity. Um, and again, how do they do that in different contexts? And that came about briefly uh, from my experience here in the United States and abroad, start thinking about how my different contexts and resources uh, influence the way teachers think about um, lesson design that will suit different uh, student needs. And again, how might we start thinking about how different model uh, might not even work across context, across context or what part of them can work in different uh, contexts. So that's just a brief of uh, uh, what my research focuses on. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks so much, Matthew. Yeah. Um, Betty, I, there's a comment from Evandra um, wanting to go next because I think she sees some connections between what Carlos had talked about. So uh, maybe go to her next. Sure, yeah, great. Evandra, you wanna follow up? Yeah, no, thank you. So thank you for sharing, Carlos. I actually, my interest started in 2015 as well. So um, in 2015, the Center for American Progress put out the first report on the school to prison pipeline and the state of Virginia was number one in the school to prison pipeline. And if you were big, black, and a boy, then you were for sure to go in Virginia. And at the time of 2015, I had a little black boy with a disability, um, and he had turned school age. So he was born in 2010, entered kindergarten in 2015. And so some of the pieces that you were speaking to, Carlos, really stood out to me, sort of this idea of like internalized impression and dehumanization. And um, my son has Asperger's and in early childhood space, that seemed to be okay. But in the K-12 space, that type of behavior or manifestations of his behavior just wasn't okay in that space. And particularly him being a black boy, he had a meltdown and it was coded for suspension as fighting, you know, and just like even that piece of uh, what was going on with his experience. But I found that his teachers were just not okay and comfortable or had the practice to handle strong emotions at the kindergarten level. It seems more tolerable in the three to fours, primarily why I love the three to fours, because there is so much empathy in that space. It is so much love and care in that space. And so it actually, my research, um, my dissertation work was professional development and how to coach teachers to be emotionally supportive, particularly with black boys. Um, and there was a lot of reflection that took place during that coaching. And um, a, a person that was advising me at the time said, you know, Evandra, you're doing a bit more than coaching. You're doing consultation. You're being reflective. You're using some practices that are not traditionally a part of the framework I used in my dissertation. And so she introduced me to her infant and early childhood mental health consultation, which is what my funded research is on right now. And so through that model, I essentially look for ways to help teachers and other adults who work with young children, humanize them, think about their emotions and their mental health. Um, social and emotional development in childhood is like really the worst phrase ever because it's all about control and policing bodies and social things and it doesn't teach children empathy and it doesn't, um, it, you know, it doesn't require a lot to humanize a child when you just want them to comply. And so anyways, that's where my research comes from and that's how I got started with it. And uh, so yeah, it just kind of tied in with where Carlos was and thinking about the environments that our children experience in school, um, particularly when there is a lack of critical consciousness on the part of all of us that have been socialized in the US. And so um, some of those internalized oppressions that Carlos was speaking of um, our adults who work with Black children, particularly Black adults who work with Black children, hold these internalized oppressions against our children. And if you know the research, Black teachers are typically much harder disciplinary-wise on Black children. And so trying to understand that and working with teachers to really reflect on why is it that they see Black boys or boys of color, children with disabilities, sort of, is not uh, welcome in their space. So thank you. Thank you, Evandra. And just jumping in here, I, I, what I really love is from both you and Carlos, and I think that's true for many of us uh, in this field, is how the, the personal, the political, and the scholarly all sort of come together uh, in terms of what motivates us, what brings us into these spaces, and what sort of inspires us to work, you know, do the work that we do. So 
Thank you for sharing that. Um, uh, I think I'm going to go with Antonio, if you want to talk a little bit about um, what got you interested in the work that you do. Yeah, well, well, let's continue on the the uh, the thread of, of connecting the personal to our our you know scholarly interests. Um, so, uh, I'm from Phoenix uh, originally. This is where home is. Uh, my family is originally from Ciudad Juarez, Mexico, but my parents immigrated here um, uh, when they were about 20 years of age. Uh, and so, I grew up uh, going to if any of you are familiar with the like the Wilson schools on like Roosevelt and like 16th Street, where uh, very much so. Uh, catering toward black and brown students, to low income students. My research is deeply influenced by my own kind of experiences as a queer person of color um, and specifically transitioning and getting a scholarship to Brophy High School. If any of you are familiar with Brophy, you know that it is a quite distinct distinct uh, experience of what I just described with the Wilson schools. And so I oftentimes describe my time in uh, at uh, Brophy uh, as one of the hardest years of my life, reconciling what my kind of ethnic identity meant in that space, what my, you know, queer identity meant in that space. Um, and it wasn't until I transitioned to college that I really started to feel affirmed and kind of the questions um, and the meaning making that I was engaging concerning my intersecting um, identities. Um, and for me, I was really deeply indebted to the higher education professionals who were helping me along in that journey. And so that is when I first saw kind of the potential for higher education to help students, specifically those with multiple minoritized identities, to really make meaning of who they are in the world. Um, and with that, you know, I went on to try to uh, continue to see how student affairs work specifically can can be instrumental um, as students uh, engage in kind of over broader identity development processes, um, but then quickly realized that not every institution and had opportunities like the ones I had at NYU, which, you know, now sounds super like duh to say, um, but then I started working at different institutional types, different regions in the country, um, and I started to see the potential, again, for higher education to be instrumental in helping students with their identity development processes, but also how higher education institutions can be deeply harmful for those with multiple minorities prioritize identities as well. And so my research is now very much so situated in thinking through um, how colleges and universities create the conditions for students to be successful, um, whether, whether it's in important student outcomes or also in their kind of identity development processes. And specifically, most of my work does have to do with queer and trans students, queer and trans students of color, um, Latinx AO communities. Um, and so very much so interested in how different environments um, create kind of these conditions and what for the professionals on college campuses are doing with the knowledge of kind of these oppressive systems. Um, so yes, and my journey brought me back here. So excited to be here. Thank you. Um, so Betty and I have been back channeling whether we want to shift questions or we want to stick to this question. I think what we're going to do is uh, we're going to stick to this question just because it is giving us a sense of where each of you is coming from and how sort of the bigger story. Um, so um, let's see, uh, Tara, do you want to uh, go next and then we'll go with Matthew? Absolutely. So my background, as I said earlier, is equitable teaching practices and what really interested me was, I give credit to my dad, who was a brilliant scientist and mathematician who I grew up, and he had two daughters, and he made sure that we could do any and everything, and he pumped me up to be so confident that there wasn't nothing that I couldn't do, and failure was a part of the process, and so I didn't see failure as, as a sign that I needed to quit, but it was something to just tell me I need to work on a little bit harder. And I always give credit to my grandmother. She, she was a professor, and I say she taught me how to be culturally relevant. And when I started teaching, I started teaching at an inner city school in Dallas. And I just knew that STEM was something that was fun because my dad made it fun, uh, brushing my teeth, eating things, everything was a STEM something activity. And it wasn't like it was quizzing me, but it was just helping me see the naturalness of it around me. And so when I started teaching, you know, the first thing you say to you like, no, I don't like science. No, I don't like math. And so that's a common response that I tended to see from primarily black and brown kids that they just absolutely hated the subject. And so it became a challenge, a fun challenge for me to make them see 
the relevance of it and to make them appreciate how they were contributors of this as much as thinking of themselves as consumers. And so my research really looks at how can we prepare educators to have that connection so that they can then make the learning not seem so punitive, but make it seem relevant in the sense that you need it. You know, you take medicine, you, you need to know these technical things so that you can have good, you know, live a good life as well as have options. And so for me, it's this idea of my interest was trying to show other people because I thought it was unfair that kids that look like me didn't see the joy in science and that. And part of it was that they weren't even given a choice to decide to opt out of it. It was just decided for them that they could not do well in it. And so my whole goal is to prepare educators to give young people an option to say, no, I don't really wanna be a scientist or a mathematician, not because they've been told that they're not good at it, but because they've tried it and they've explored it and they've made the decision on their own. Thank you. Um, so Matthew, on to you. Um, the question is how you got interested in the work that you do. Uh, thank you. I'm just going to build on, you know, my initial uh, uh, explanation of my own background. I grew up in Nigeria, so I spent many years there before I migrated to the United States. And again, I taught in Nigeria, um, so also in the U.S. So I started thinking about the notion of, uh, it makes me think about some cultural differences, essentially uh, the idea of epistemic belief. How do people think about the notion of knowledge and knowing? And how do your cultural background growing up inform what actually counts as knowledge? And again, how we structure our, our lessons for young learners uh, to start thinking about how might that speak to different kind of notion of knowledge and knowing? Because uh, growing up, I realized that uh, there are some things that, uh, you know, my experience growing up, uh, consider very important, but get into a different culture, it comes with a different dynamics. And again, seeing uh, the idea that we have this increase in diversity in US schools, I started thinking about, okay, wait a minute. Uh, I will give an example. Uh, my first, uh, very first class in the United States, we were assigned a textbook. And in the textbook, in, in one of the pages, there was something they call ballet. I've never heard about ballet before. I know about theater. So uh, <laughs> that was where the interest actually, I, I mean, I started making sense of many of these things like, okay, could something as simple as different word for different activity become a concern for a young learner? So I had to go back and look at what is a ballet and how, how does that relate to, you know, what I actually know growing up. So it becomes an idea of what actually can that knowledge to young learners. Could it be that we are not speaking the language that are different experiences, I, I, I mean, that, that are aligned with different experiences and different diversity, different ways of thinking, different ways of knowing? Could it be that we are not speaking to that realm of knowing? So uh, essentially, currently, I'm looking at what I call uh, how do uh, teacher candidate draw from many of these resources? So I consider those different experiences as resources. So how do they draw from personal life experience? How do individual draw from different curriculum structure? How do different people draw from even their own professors? Like by me looking at this professor, do I see something that actually resonates with me by this particular professor? And how, can, how does that influence the way I actually learn to teach? So it becomes a question of more of a mix of cultural plus epistemological uh, dynamics of how people actually get to know and how what counts as knowledge within the realm of how we design curriculum and teach elementary school students. So overall, uh, uh, looking um, uh, the, the whole idea is that to start thinking about, uh, to become flexible, uh, to start thinking about uh, the notion of how can we, how can we become intentional in the way we design curriculum? How can we become intentional in the way we teach? How can we become intentional in the way we even self-evaluate? 
and the way we become intentional in the way we see our student. That way we are in a better position to actually use our, our own personal experiences as a resource rather than liability and see everything that students bring into classroom as actually resources that we can draw from in different ways to uh, make sense of uh, learning to teach. So that is where I am right now. And, I, and again, I do that across context so that that gives me an idea of what's, what, what works in context A, does it work in B? And what, what, what are those overlaps that work across culture? Because we have international teacher candidate among us all the time. We go abroad, we work with different diversity, we work with, with different school system, and those ideas can transfer uh, within and outside, uh, you know, different contexts. Thank you. Betty, I know you're gonna jump on the quiz. I just had a quick comment I wanted to make. So Matthew, your, your point about ballet reminded me, like growing up in India, reading like uh, Darwin's theory of evolution and the, one of the classic examples given of the horse, and one of the early ones is the Eohippus, which is always described of the size of a fox terrier. Now imagine you're growing up in India, you have no idea what a fox terrier is. It is the size of a you know, a giraffe or a monkey. You know, you have no idea. And Stephen J. Gold has this great essay where he traces back, and it turns out it is this English gentleman who's who love to go hunting who first made that analogy, and we have kept repeating it in textbooks over and over again irrespective of the cultural or the other context, whether it makes sense or not. So thank you for sharing that because I think that's such an important critical piece there. So Betty, on to you. So there's nothing posted in the chat yet, but I wanted to ask, does anyone else here want to ask a question um, of one or more of the participants here or make a comment? We'd love to hear from you about what more you'd like to like to talk about here. So I hate wait time, but I'm going to do wait time for at least like 30 seconds. <laughs> Anyone? No. Um, okay. So I'm actually going to deviate a little bit from our prepared questions um, and ask something that oh, we, I think we always kind of struggle with. It seems like the issue of culture and cultural relevance is really a theme across a lot of your work. So I was wondering, and I'll open it up, I can call on one of you, but what does that mean to you in your work? And can you give like a concrete example, maybe in teaching or whatever? Um, so does anyone want to jump in? Uh... You're speaking my love language now. <laughs> All right, here we go. So that's really what I do. Um, it's really all I do as it relates to my research. But interestingly, when people talk, and in my experience about culturally relevant and, and using it as a tool to engage um, often it's done in ways that are considering how can we help the black and brown kids do better? Or how can we provide supports to educators who are going into communities that are not of their own and allow them opportunities to be successful? And so for me, it's kind of not even none of that. It's, it's about one, as Gloria Lansing Billing talks about it, the academic success, just unlearning everything. What, are, what do we mean by academic success? And realizing that that academic success doesn't look the same for everyone. And honoring that and, and being clear about what that means in your own practice as an educator. The other thing when we talk about cultural competence is this idea of how do I stay and help the individual learner stay connected to their culture, as well as embrace whatever the dominant culture is. So being dual in that sense. And I really didn't pick that up until I started teaching in West Africa for seven years where I had 65 different nationalities at the international school that I taught at. And I had to learn how to be culturally relevant um, because my American way of teaching wasn't working. Meaning I couldn't come in there and tell my students to, to throw things in the trash. I had to say rubbish because for everyone trash wasn't something that they use, but rubbish was a term that they were most familiar with. And so it was the best experience for me because one, 
I had been immersed into a culture where I was no longer the dominant one. And I had to figure out how to connect with everyone else if I was going to be successful. So it was a very humbling experience. And so appreciating that, I learned as I taught science to honor their native tongue as well as English, because that was the, the language that was expected for them to speak in the schools, but also giving credit to their native tongue and not making it something that was uh, a barrier in some sense, but actually a resource that could be enhancing not only me, but for everyone. And then the last thing about culturally relevant is this idea that social political consciousness development, like how do I get individuals to think about how they're engaging with others might be offensive, oppressive, but then also realizing how can I share power and think about it in ways that are more expanded as opposed to just thinking about my own little world. And so it's this, this I mean, for me, it's a lot of things, but I wish for a lot of people when we talk about culturally relevant, that it's more expansive than just saying, oh, I've got common names that people can recognize, oh, the kids are doing well, but it's this idea of how can we activate civic engagement among all of us in ways that would help us understand and appreciate what equity looks like and how that can actually be promoted in, in not only our practice, but in the way that we learn. So yeah, let me be quiet because this is my love language and I want to I want to share power. So let me. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Now, so uh, I, oh, go ahead. I would like to piggyback on uh, what Tara just said, and I'm going to give a, a couple of examples that actually help me think about, uh, you know, my own personal life and start thinking about how um, I use that in relating to my own student as well, to start thinking about. Uh, how the notion of cultural culturally relevant pedagogy or culturally relevant teaching. I look at it from the perspective of access to what we might consider uh, the officially sanctioned curriculum. To start thinking about, okay, uh, if we have to promote culturally uh, relevant pedagogy among young learner, I was I usually think about it as per how much access do young learner have to the official curriculum, starting from that point. Because again, like Tara said, this is one of the key areas in which we, we kind of measure success. And again, if I'm unable to have access to it, then what kind of success am I gonna record? For example, in my work with uh, one of the uh, elementary schools in uh, Minnesota, let me just put it that way so you know where it, what it was. Uh, one of the days they called me in, and I know some of you could have heard about this story because it really touched my, uh, I mean, it really shaped the way uh, I think about things. So they called me in as a curriculum consultant for the school and said, hey, uh, in the SOL, this particular young uh, black girl has been failing social studies, which is where I specialize for the past three years. And they said, okay, what can we do? And I said, well, let's start from looking at what part of social studies is this person failing. I am confident that this will not be like you're just filling the whole social studies as well. So when we look at it, I realized that there was a particular question that this young girl has been failing. They said, she's been getting wrong for the past three years. And what was the question? The question was, where do you post your letter? To a typical American, to a typical learner person, so to say, to myself, I think post your letter, post office, that's the answer. So I look at I, when I look at the option, I found two interesting options that were possibilities. Uh, one of them for sure was the post office. The other one was the drugstore, like Walgreens, CVS. That was another option. And that was the option that this young black girl has been picking consistently three times. Well, she's been, they said she's been getting really wrong. So I said, hey, come here. Tell me how your parent or any adult in your household pose their bill. When you get, for example, when you get a power bill, how do you pay it? How do you post it? They say, yeah, usually we get it in an envelope. She was so specific. Uh, in the envelope, there's another one inside the envelope. I said, okay, go on. 
and say, when we open it, my mom will write a check. I said, okay, your mom said, and what do you do with it? We put it in the inner envelope, put a stamp on it. And across the street, there's a Walgreens that has a small post office at the back. That is where they post the letter, uh, they post the bill. So I started thinking about, okay, here we go now. This is an individual whose answer, whose experience is that the post office to this young person is behind the drugstore. And the option right on there says the drugstore. She got it. She's been getting it for three years. So I started thinking, and I got to that point to say, hey, come explain to me because I have lived in that community, in a community where what we have was a CVS and we just walked to the back and draw the letter off in a small box like that. And that was it. So it makes me start thinking about the question of even culturally uh, relevant uh, teaching in, uh, within the realm of curriculum access. And again, that again ties into the idea of my own example of ballet when I didn't know where the ballet was. Uh, in my home British brain sometimes when you say, I don't know what, it, I was just learning about Boulevard. It used to be called Express, walkway, sidewalk. So working with different, you know, people with different background who see the same thing in different ways, in multiple ways, you know, uh, you know, that experience has challenged my own thinking to start thinking about. When we say culturally relevant pedagogy, I start looking at it within the realm of curriculum access along the line of how my, uh, that impact uh, the idea of dominant knowledge, who gets to know, and who actually gets to pass. Because this individual has been passing for the past three years to me, but you know, to the official curriculum, she's been failing. So uh, it, it becomes really interesting to me to start thinking about uh, those day-to-day -day example to see how my those little, little practices in the way we structure question, in the way we, uh, you know, structure our, uh, you know, our procedure, in the way we even ask question, the way we use multiple languages, uh, multiple, uh, if we know, the way we use multiple uh, example to describe the same thing so that multiple students can have access to, you know, the content that we're looking at. And just the uh, concrete example, the uh, examples in which I've seen culturally uh, pedagogy being interpreted as curriculum access and as what kinds of knowledge and who actually get to dictate what knowledge is within the larger scope of formal curriculum. Thank you, Matthew. Um, Betty? Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, um, we were thinking of, and I don't know if you want to put this in the chat, Punya, or, um, you know, I can just ask people to also shout out. Um, just first, thanks. I mean, we could talk about this topic for so much longer. It makes me think of some of my own kind of eye-opening experiences about assumptions I've made about what my students knew or didn't knew, didn't know. Um, across the board. And I think, you know, what we just heard from our participants really shows how complex this issue is of trying to understand our students' context um, and culture. So Punya is, Punya was thinking of shifting gears a bit to ask questions of the participants. Do you wanna pose this um, question or request, Punya? And I think it relates a bit to, to a question or um, comment that Mark made about helping our new faculty or newish faculty be successful. So Punya? Um, yeah, so I just dropped a, a question request for all because there is a lot of collective wisdom and experience in the Zoom room. Um, so would love to hear from others um, who have joined in our meeting, our, you know, our new faculty. Uh, if they have any thoughts, suggestions, ideas uh, for what helps, you know, make a successful academic career here at ASU, each institution is unique in its own way. So we'd love to hear from you. So you can drop it in the chat or better still speak up and we can hear some other voices uh, as well. And I'm sure people have lots of things to say. They're just being shy, which is really I know, surprising. Unusual. <laughs> yeah. And Mark also suggested that our participants could also pose questions too, if you oh, want to put idea. those in the chat or whatever about 
um, anything to do with, you know, what will help you be successful or I suppose what, what are more fun things to do or anything that you'd like to um, learn from our group here. I think while we were waiting, I really wanted to just share something. And I know Carlos was leaning forward and he wanted to share too. So I'll be quick. And I think Carlos, that you should jump in too, because I know we were kind of involved in that last conversation. But to think about how education in the US was a, a system built on exclusion and segregation. So all the things that we've necessarily been talking about today is it plays a role in that, right? Like when Black children and children of color were integrated, they were integrated, their bodies, but not their curriculum not their teachers, not their community, et cetera. So this idea of what all of us have been talking about, it really resonates with me because of the policy aspect of it. It was written in the way and it's functioning as it is intended to function. And so now we're all trying to find these pieces that were left out in after BV board um, when the teachers and the curriculum in the community didn't follow kids of color, but it just their bodies went into all white spaces. And then they were expected to have those experience relate to those all white spaces. So I just wanted to share that and tag that on to a piece. And then Carlos, go ahead and jump in because you were leaning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you, you Evander. Um, yeah, really quick, I think just the idea of culture, I think the work that I do because it's participatory, so I'm, and I'm working with young people, so I, this is really broadly speaking, but I'm, I walk into a space of youth culture, right, and primarily Latinx youth culture. So as, a, as an uh, adult who probably imposes adultism in many different ways, then I try to challenge and push back against that. But I think so. I think about youth culture in this space that I'm in, and also the, the dynamics that are going on amongst the youth and myself when we're developing a curriculum, when we're implant like in uh, putting pedagogical practices in place, or we're setting up this space. Like all these sort of youth culture or adult dynamics are going on within my observations and thought process. And then the last thing, like while I, I while I understand the importance and relevance of, of culturally relevant and, and sustaining pedagogy. My body of work is really embedded in humanizing pedagogy within the fairing work because a lot of the work that the stuff that happened in Iowa was, I mean, the, the young people that I worked with, I mean, they were scared of, of being deported. They were scared of being separated from family, being, I mean, so it was a lot of humanizing that went on in addition to the cultural, cultural work we did. But um, I just want to kind of, you know, point out those distinctions and not that, you know, one superior or inferior to the other, but just to kind of uh, put sort of my body of work in, in this conversation that's going on. And I know there's many issues with Fairy's work too, with the work that I do around young women. So, I mean, there's, you know, issues with that as, as well. Thank you. I share that, Carlos. Oh my God. Like, thank you so much. Like, we have to have humanizing pedagogy too. Like, that piece is so missing. I love this conversation. I think we need more of this because I hadn't thought I'm not as familiar with humanizing pedagogy as I am with, say, culturally relevant pedagogy, perhaps having come from Wisconsin years ago and having worked with um, Gloria Ladson Billings. So I know I, those ideas have evolved quite a bit. And I think it would be great for us to really talk more about this, not only in relationship to you know, how we're training teachers, but I mean, how we're working with our own students. I was actually thinking of a couple of my EDD students who are from traditionally minoritized populations and how, how different an experience it has been, um, you know, trying to help them navigate this even more flexible structure of the EDD program. So anyway. Well, and with that, I, I can jump in just because I think we're coming from a different context when it comes to higher and post-secondary ed um, and thinking about, you know, this question around culturally relevant, um, just broadly perspectives, you know, part of my work has been moving towards the areas and has been existing in the areas of Hispanic serving institutions. Um, and especially as we here at ASU and would love to have conversations with people about this, um, you know, start to think about leaning into this identity of being a Hispanic serving institution. There's so much that comes with that designation other than simply meeting the 25% 
you know, undergraduate full-time enrollment statistic. And so that gets me thinking about how are we in the Mary Lou Fulton Teachers College, right, thinking about what it does it mean to adopt a, the identity of being a Hispanic serving institution in our curricula, in our work with our students um, here at the institution. Um, I know Cristobal and I have, have been having some good conversations around this, so happy to engage with, with all of this. But I do think that, you know, to integrating Claren's question I see in there as well, um, you know, we, we are seeing the literature and uh, scholarship on HSIs continue to evolve, right? Especially as we think, continue to think about who are Hispanic slash Latinx AO communities broadly. Who do we default to when we think about these communities? How do we operate in very monolithic understandings of Latinx AO uh, communities as well? And so happy to to talk through those things with folks. Awesome. Now there's just a great chat going on too about trauma and emotions. And I think Carlos, you're talking about healing. So that's the humanizing pedagogy, Betty. So culturally okay. relevant and culturally responsive has its space. But when you start talking about the trauma and the well being and the healing and the identity, you're humanizing a person and allowing them to have experience. That's a bit different. So Carlos and I have already connected in the <laughs> offline because I'm so here for, for, for humanizing pedagogy for sure. Whoa. All right, I'm following up with you all. I have a lot to learn. So this is just great. Um, I'm really fascinated by this. So, so yeah, um, but don't want to dominate the conversation. Other folks want to jump in, make a comment, um, add to what I'll our jump in. Saying. I'll jump in, Betty. Um, yes, thank you. This is my going into my 15th year at ASU. So it's so exciting to see um, younger scholars and kind of the the direction. And you can see, I'm very thankful that you organized this event to learn more about new faculty and their work and some of the exciting directions. Um, some advice I think is ASU is so massive. When I started, um, it was a lot smaller. And so I think that you have to really actively find ways to make that smaller community the more intimate community because it can be very vast. And so one of the things that was helpful in my career is um, those of us that kind of started at the same time and went through similar um, milestones and, and um, you know, kind of going through mid tenure review and all of those things, but it helped to have that a little bit of a smaller community. And so that cohort that you come in with, I think there's a special bond there and just would encourage you to cultivate that and um, to reach out and support one another, not just on an academic level, but on a personal level as well, because I think um, while there are so many resources, which is great at being at a large university, sometimes you can get lost a little bit. And so it's helpful to kind of form that more intimate community. And, and that's something that has been helpful to me um, throughout my career. Carla, did you have something to say? I thought you had your hand up. I think she was just Sorry. applauding. I was uh, just applauding. Oh, um, that was applause. Okay. Been, <laughs> very helpful for me. Um, and I agree with Leanna wholeheartedly. So um, Betty, this is something that you and I have talked about as a way of, you know, new faculty getting to know sort of people who have been here for a while. And so I want to get a sense of whether people think this is a good idea or not. We were thinking that junior faculty could get a coupon to Ngrain to take anybody in the college for a free lunch. And no sort of strings attached. It wouldn't mean that you, know, that you are committed to working together or something, but that you just get a chance to talk to people across the college, uh, which often, you know, given the fact that A, we are coming out of a pandemic and B, we are spread over three campuses is sometimes hard to do. So I don't know whether uh, that seems like a decent idea or really one of those punya-ish dumb ideas. All right, so Gustavo is giving a thumbs up. Awesome. But I'm looking at the time, we are at 56. Um, any other piece? I know there's a lot of knowledge here and expertise, experience. So any other thoughts um, for our new colleagues uh, here? Happy to have everybody here. Love this group. Thank you for being here and for uh, talking today. 
Thank you, Lauren. I like this forum too. This is great. So one thing I will just say, if any of you have ideas for future just an hour sessions, please feel free to share them with Punya and I. We're mapping out the rest of the Fridays for the semester and would love to be responsive to whatever you all would find interesting. I kind of feel like we'll do a few of these and have enough topics just generated from these sessions to be able to plan out another year, but we wanted to do, do want to open up to your input. Um, well, and Pune, do you want to do a is, plug for next year? Oh yeah, go ahead. Clearly there is one on humanizing pedagogy that we can very easily do, and there will be a lot of interest for it. So that's one topic. Um, but absolutely, Betty and I have, you know, Claren and I have been putting our heads together, uh, trying to come up with, you know, and, and frankly, this really does emerge from a, a feeling that I feel very strongly that we get into academia because this is a place where we can engage with each other on ideas, get our ideas pushed back upon, um, learn from each other, and we often don't have a chance to do that. Um, so if we can just get an hour every Friday that we can give to this, that's wonderful. Um, so thank you all of you for coming in um, today. And Claren, if you don't mind dropping those two links to the surveys again, we will keep pestering you about this. Um, and would you know uh, just so that we get this information out, we have lots of plans for how to promote uh, the work that you do. But unless we know, um, and it's very hard given the size of our college and how spread out we are to find out what interesting thing people are doing, um, you know. And so please uh, take a few minutes. You know, it's once a month for that faculty, you know, sort of scholarly roundup. And this other survey, which is just once uh, that we'll be sending out. Of course, again, plugging the myeducation.asu.edu website. Uh, please go there. There are lots of resources, um, everything from HR stuff to tenure and promotion stuff. Uh, we will be archiving these talks over there as well. We'll create a page for that. Um, and um, again, this is every Friday, you know, uh, 12 to 1. I would love for you uh, to stop by. We've been at one point, we had 38 participants today, which was awesome. And so thank you again all for joining in and um, uh, looking forward to uh, more sessions like this. So Betty, any last comments? Well, just thanks again to everyone who came. This was really fun and exciting. So I'm energized to end my Friday afternoon on a very stimulating conversation. I have lots of ideas to think about, thanks to you all. So, so thanks again and look for future invitations. Um, so do you wanna put in a plug for next week, Punya? Yeah, or, so no? first of all, thank you to our five uh, panelists today. Welcome to ASU. I know some of you started during the pandemic, so it's great to have you here. We had a wonderful session last Friday uh, over lunch and, and thank you for taking time to you know, share your work and experience with all of us. Uh, next uh, Friday, um, as I'd mentioned at the beginning, we want to do a session around exploring what it means to be transdisciplinary. Uh, we are all trained within particular disciplinary structures. We work with colleagues across, we do inter, we do multi, and then we have this term called transdisciplinary, which ASU seems to have embraced, uh, which we as a college, you know, in our PhD program seem to have embraced. Uh, we just want to have a discussion around it. There is no right or wrong answer, I'm sure, uh, but I think it's worthwhile for us to give a little bit of time to think about that. So we will have a panel of a few faculty, but it's like an open discussion and conversation. So thank you again and see you yeah. next Friday, if not before. Yeah, have a great holiday weekend, folks. Thanks again for joining us. Take care. Mm -hmm.